Hello and welcome to the Common Sense Gospel. I'm Danny Simmons. And I'm Kurt Norbert. And our title today is God's Compassionate Judgment. And Kurt had found a passage in 2 Chronicles 36, and we were discussing that and have been, and we wanted to share this with all of you. But there really is a reason behind it. Uh, many times when people read in the Bible, or if they're, especially if they're looking for an issue with God or his judgment or, or how he deals with man, then it won't take them long to find a case in point where God utterly destroys a group or a nation um, and the way he chastises his own people. So that challenge is always there before us. But in Second Chronicles 36, 15 through 17, we want you to listen to this passage and, and think about God's judgment, but also the compassion that is tied to it. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. So there's one of those places where God explains where he is, and then he moves the king of the Chaldeans, and he calls him his servant. It's by his will and by his purpose that he allows Babylon to come in and to destroy. What's the point? I sent messengers to you over and over and over again. And what struck me about this passage when I was reading it is how much it tells us about God and how he deals with man, deals with his people. And as you read this passage, you see his mercy and his compassion. In fact, his compassion is specifically noted. Uh, you see his patience. Uh, you also see God's justice being meted out because there is a limit. And then you see the, the motive for it all is God's love. And so when I saw that, I just thought that would be good to talk about because that pretty much encompasses all of God's character when he's dealing with rebellion and sin and how he responds to that. Uh, unfortunately, whether w unwilling or, or willing, a lot of people, and we've talked about this in the past, tend to be selective when they look at God. They just see his judgments. Oh, he brought the Chaldeans in and killed everybody. and That's mean. But they don't take into consideration everything else surrounding that. Right. That he worked with these people. He, he, I love that, that phrase, he sent his messengers rising up early yeah. and sending them. That's used repeatedly in the Old Testament, especially regarding the prophets, because that's what God did. He sent them, and they rose up early, and they constantly warned the people, and the people wouldn't listen. So what happens? That's what we see uh, unfolding in this passage. Yeah, and, and and so if we take it really frame by frame, Second Chronicles thirty six, the, in, there in fifteen, as you just said, the God of their fathers sent warnings to them by His messengers, and so just there, there's a passage here from Jeremiah that's mm. that's very interesting because again, we want to take the broader picture of what we're talking about. It's not just saying let's look at Second Chronicles thirty six so we can prove our point. It's take a look at the timeline. Look how many people were involved in trying to to impress upon God's people, please turn back to the Lord. And, and, and then their rebellion, uh, when the request or the commandment was, was uh, given to them. So in Jeremiah 25, beginning in verse 2, it says, Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So that's everybody. Saying, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, this is the 23rd year in which the Lord, the word of the Lord has come to me and I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all of his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear. They said, repent now every, of his, every one of his evil way and his evil doings and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord. 
that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. So in this case with Jeremiah, he says, since since it's about the 13th year of Josiah, and then he tells them, 23 years yeah. since Cl- I started a quarter morning. century. 23 years. Yeah. And that's one man who goes to the people as God commands and watches them. They are so put off by Jeremiah now that they're threatening him. Men from his own city threaten to kill him. His life is awful because people are insisting on living in sin. And so it's not just like, well, why did God do that? We got to back up. He, he asked men, I mean, Hosea is another one that comes to mind. You live out in your life what I've been going through with the people I love and cherish. And, and so all of those experiences were supposed to relate to these people who, who tried their very best by the will of God to, t- to tell God's people, please come back. Yeah. How can a person look at that and say, well, you're not fair. You didn't give me a chance. <laughs> you know, from my viewpoint, you could easily say God gave them too many chances. He, he could have just taken care of it right from the, the get-go. But as I blurted in on, on what you were saying, almost a quarter of a century there, Jeremiah is pleading with the people, warning them day after day after day that Doom is coming if you don't change. And they could see it because during his time, the city was surrounded and besieged. That's right. They were in trouble. And still they wouldn't listen. He told them, look out. Okay, there they are. There's Babylon, just like God said. If you will just surrender to them, everything will be okay. Oh, we can't. that's treason. You're t- you're, you've gone over to the Babylonians. What really highlights it for me is... <laughs> King Zedekiah calling Jeremiah in private and saying, what's the word of the Lord? Tell me what I need to do. (laughs) And he goes, just surrender. Well, if I do that, the people will stone me. They won't like me anymore. Are you for real? Yeah. Because of pride and ego, you're not willing to do the word of the Lord. And that's, that's generally the case with everybody. Yeah. Pride breeds rebellion. Yeah, it really does. And that's that's an excellent point. The what they were going through, the the trouble that was on all sides. And as you read through the book of Jeremiah as we, you know, talking about him, that we we hear and read about false prophets that were there mm-hmm. who were saying the opposite of Jeremiah. And so the people they have two opposing opinions basically. They both men are saying thus says the Lord. But how do we test that and how should they have tested it? by the word of God. They had the law of Moses and they knew if they would just read it, they would know clearly we are not doing what God has called us to do. We're not who God called us to be. But that takes effort and nobody wanted to do it apparently, or very few wanted to do it. And so Jeremiah has this great challenge in front of him. He's giving them hard words that are true and the false prophets are giving them soft and easy words that are false. Yeah, and to your point, when you were pointing out that all they had to do to prove whether Jeremiah was the true prophet or these other guys is look to the law. And that is exactly what Josiah did. The law had been so neglected that they didn't even, they had completely forgotten about it until a copy of it was found in the mess in the temple as they were cleaning it out. That's right. They brought it to Josiah and it was read before him and he instantly could see we have not obeyed the Lord, and there is great wrath toward us. And and he set to work trying to lead the people to repentance, trying to get them to see where they were and calling on the mercy of God. So, yes, you can find out what your status is with, with God by looking at his word. You can understand it, so you'll know whether you're right or not. You'll, you will have your situation with God revealed to you, right. then it's up to you to do something about it. And I can just imagine having Deuteronomy 28 
and 29 read to Josiah with the blessings and the cursings. And he, could, he was saying, these cursings are coming upon us because we have sinned. We have rebelled and not kept the law. And indeed, you know, per, the people had some surface repentance under Josiah, but as soon as his reign was over and the, the, the next king succeeded him, they went right back to their idolatry. They did. They quickly went, went back to the filth. It's interesting you mentioned Deuteronomy 28 because I have just a list. I realized that Second Chronicles 36, where we see that passage and the life of Jeremiah, it's in the same, same time window. Jeremiah is there when the Babylonians come in. Mm-hmm. So that that would be cheating on our part if we were just like, see, Jeremiah says so. <laughs> but it, it's still true. But but if, if you back up, and I, I went back to Moses, Deuteronomy 28, as you said, the blessing for doing what's right and the cursing which would come if you disobeyed the voice of the Lord. It was very, very clear. Then Noah, we can go back even further. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So we, we know that he's building this ark. God has warned him and, and in his actions and, and, and apparently by what he said to the people around him, he warned them He's a preacher of righteousness, of righteous things. So some kind of warning was given. We don't have that recorded, but they had a time and opportunity. Some of them did to repent and say, he's right. We, we have really gone away from, from what's right and what's appropriate. Uh, Daniel is a good case because Daniel, he's brought into a foreign country as a young boy, relatively young, and he honors God his entire life. With all that God is doing to correct his people, Daniel is growing up in that time window of the chastisement, and he never turns from God. So that's interesting. I, I love Daniel for that very reason. Uh, Elijah is a great example. He he asked the people on Mount Carmel, how long will you waver between two opinions? And he's asking them, decide today who will you serve and it's a shame to speak to godly people and they don't know what the answer is in situations like that with elijah and then the the other one i had was lot in sodom and gomorrah before it's destroyed that that city was long gone um you know spiritually and the night before the destruction rains down on them he warns the men of the city do not do this wicked thing and they and they will not have it and not only that uh, when the angels come to Abraham and tell him what they're going to do, they make a point of passing on God's feeling about this. Basically, the the story is that the report of what's going on in Sodom has come up into heaven before God. Instead of just sending lightning bolts down, he sends his messengers. He says, I will go and see, and then I'll know. Yeah. So, he goes to confirm it first, and all this is from you know our viewpoint, the way we can understand it. God confirms the report first. And then, as you just noted, he gives them another chance. That night, don't do this wicked thing. Yep. Well, they want to anyway, even after they're struck blind. So the next day, God renders his judgment. But it's not as if he did not give them a chance. He gave them chances repeatedly. Yeah, and even leading into that, it, when the Lord speaks to Abraham about what he shall do, Abraham says, well, how about if there's yeah. 50 right? Would you destroy the righteous of the wicked? And that famous quote there, the, the judge of all the earth shall do what's right. Abraham knows that. And he says, okay, if there's 50, you know, and so they works that mm-hmm. down. When Lot is told and the, and the angels tell him, you got to get you out of here, he goes and tells his son-in-laws and they, they, they think he's joking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they don't take it seriously at all. Which goes back to us and our responsibility to look around. Is this good or is this evil? Should I be here? Should I be involved with this? You know, those are the safeguards for us so that we can honor God with our lives. But more importantly, for us personally, is that judgment won't rain rain down on us as it has in times past. God has not changed. Yeah, and even then, he kept his word because he agreed with Abraham. All right, if I find 10, I'll spare the city. They could only find four. I know. Lot, his wife, who fell after they left the city, disobeying God, and the two daughters. Yeah. Started at five. Couldn't even get 10. Yeah. And so God had to deal with it. But, you know, you were listing all of those examples of of prophets and and warnings that God gave. When you look at from the time that the Jews 
Israel settled the land, the land that had been promised to them, going through judges, repeated rebellion, repentance, deliverance, over and over and over again, all the way down to Malachi, the last Old Testament prophet, the last Old Testament book, you've got over a thousand years of God dealing with his people. You're going to complain about God not being patient, not being fair, when he gives them a thousand years and examples. The northern kingdom was conquered by Assyria. That's Judah right. should have taken notice of that. He tells them that, too. And he tells them that. Yeah. What about your sister? Then he warns them about Babylon. Babylon gets there, and they still won't listen. <laughs> yeah. And yet God continues to try to work with them. You just, the to me, <laughs> I guess it's a good thing I'm not God, but God's too patient. <laughs> and I'm... I'm just using that to illustrate right. because yeah. no, I understand. we appreciate and we're thankful and we praise God for his patience. But he gives man chances to the nth degree until he simply cannot ignore it any longer. He wants to see us do what's right. Yeah. If there's any hope in that, then he's willing to work toward that goal. And, and that's yeah. such a beautiful thing about him. This is compassionate judgment. And one other thing about that, when I look back, at the days, say Jeremiah, for example, um, they didn't have television. I don't know. Do you know that? They don't have televisions back then. Really? Yeah. Like, I don't even think cars were there. Boy, we're going back now. Yeah, that's before my time. Mm -hmm. Maybe. <laughs> so I, I noticed your graying hair there, Danny. It's... My point is that, <laughs> what was my point? My point is <laughs> that we, you, you think, if you think about them, like we look from where we are and we say, what was so attractive that they wanted to keep sinning? You know, what what was it? I picture people back in those days, they had families. There was wholesome lifestyle for the most part. Why, what was it about sin where they, they thought, we have to do this, we have to worship false idols? And that always just blows my mind. And I think they weren't challenged at all because of what we have today with internet, all the accessibility, the drug and alcohol that's available to everyone at any given time. You know, I feel like the the scales have tipped and, and it's just, there's no way that we could succeed, but it's still the same problem. Since God doesn't change, that which is sin doesn't change. And so the, I would admit that the devil has some new tools, but it's the same sin he's pulling us toward. Yep. We haven't changed and the devil's methods haven't changed. We've, as you said, he's just, he, we've given him some new tools and in in and of themselves, they're they're neither right nor wrong. The internet is just there. It's a tool. When we use it properly, we can benefit greatly from the information we can learn and, and right. many different things. But you can also indulge in sin through it. The oh, net yeah. can become your idol because it's the most important thing to you. That's right. Got to have my internet fix every day, yep. whatever it is. You bow down to it and you spend all your time thinking about that and getting back to it and those kind of things. That's a God. It yep. controls you, your mind, and your time. That is a God. And so you know, we pointed out already that that it's, it's broader than just, say, Jeremiah and Second Chronicles 36. Jesus goes back all the way to the beginning of time when he condemns the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 23. That's that mm -hmm. scathing rebuke throughout the entire chapter. But in Matthew 23, beginning in 33, Jesus says, Serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets. He says, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. He goes back to Abel, who is the son of Adam and Eve. Yep, the, the first victim of sin, really. And uh, how was he a messenger sending a warning? Because he obeyed and followed God by sacrificing that which God approved of. Yep. And Cain said, I don't want any part of that, and kills his brother. Because I guess, you know, Abel embarrassed him, or who, who knows what his problem was. 
So one does what's right, the other does what's wrong. God corrects the one who did what, what is wrong. And the guy who did what's wrong says, you know, I know what I'm going to do. What? What What are you going to do, Cain? Do what's right? No, no, no. I'm going to kill my brother. There, there's sin at work. But one thing I've always observed there, Jesus is basically covering from A to Z. Abel to Zechariah. Nice. Everything in between is God dealing with them, but them continuing to repent or to uh, rebel against God. And that's Stephen's point in Acts chapter 7. He just goes down through the history of Israel and <laughs> he, he brings up all these examples. Here's Joseph. He was rejected. Here's Moses. He was rejected. You know, who made you a deliverer over us? So here's this pattern of God raising someone up to deal with the people, yet the people generally, because there is always a faithful remnant, mm -hmm. but the people reject that one that's been raised up. And so Stephen nails it home, you uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always reject the Holy Spirit. So you haven't changed. And what they it's do? It's still the same thing. And guess what? Yep. They stoned Stephen. They rejected the Holy Spirit. So it, it, man doesn't change. The tools might, but it always comes down to your choice. That's right. Am I going to listen to what God has to say and act on it and accept it, or am I going to reject it and rebel? That's right. It's and, always And God will way. respond to that choice. He absolutely will. So... He says, I sent messengers to warn, and, and the next part of that passage is rising up early and sending them. And mm -hmm. so I just did a quick search, and it's very interesting. Jacob rose up early. Moses, Joshua rose up early in Joshua 6 to deal with Achan. Mm -hmm. That was awful. Yep. Samuel rose up early. David, the prophet and the king, rose up early. Jeremiah eleven seven. God says through his prophet, I earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting, saying, Obey my voice. Jesus also, not to be excluded from this group, rose early in the morning. And, you know, I think of the statement that he says to his mother when he's 12, I must be about my father's business. Did you not know, you know, the, mm -hmm. this is who I am. And so we see him many times rising up early to tend to the things that God sent him to do. And there again, is the extension of God's compassion, his, his patience toward the people. He wasn't lackadaisical about the work that was being done to try to bring the people back. He rose up early in his prophets, in Jesus, in all of the messengers that he sent to the people. They were immediate about addressing the message to the people, telling them what the problem was and what they needed to do about it. So God didn't leave any stone unturned he didn't leave anything out in what he wanted. He didn't leave any any doubts among the people, any misinformation. Well, God, you, you didn't cover that. No, he rose up early, constantly warning the people and telling them exactly what they needed to do and what would happen if they did or if they didn't. God would bless or he would discipline them with the promises that he gave in the instance we're looking at here, the coming of the Babylonians, they were his tool to punish his people. Yeah, they sure were. So what about the people who are left that are serving God? Because we, we have these, it's just a repeated theme, whether you look at the book of Judges by itself or throughout all human history, God sets a tone, gives his expectation and man always, always without failure, drifts from that truth, the standard of truth, and eventually is unrecognizable as a child of God. I mean, not, not even close. And, and, you know, God deals with that there. So what about the people who are still faithful to him in those dark times? Because that's something that we should be thinking about. We don't know when God will move. Only he knows. But we can see that things are getting worse. And, and, you know, mm -hmm. it can be discouraging for someone who truly loves the Lord, honestly loves God. There's so few left, it seems like, unless, I'm, you know, unless I'm like Elijah and just don't know that there's more than I thought. But it just seems like, you know, there's there's so few and, and the world is 
hopelessly lost and just spiraling down so quickly, the way we reason things out and, and the way we're waiting for Washington to fix this dreadful mess that we're in, it's never going to happen. Not without the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, and I, I thought a lot about that. But one thing I really enjoyed in studying the prophets and especially the minor prophets and in teaching classes here at Northwest on the prophets, one thing I constantly pointed out is that you can look at any period of time, no matter how bad it is. For example, the book of Judges, it's just nothing but a bunch of misery. You have the people rebelling against God. They, they slide away from him, like you say. They, they drift. They go into sin. And so God chastises them. He punishes them for that and puts them under the hand of the, an oppressor, the Philistines, the Midianites, who, whoever it might be. Finally, the people realize, hey, we have, we've left the Lord. That's why we're suffering. So they repent, and God raises up a deliverer. And so the, the shackles are thrown off, the people are free again, and they drift. Yeah. And the cycle just keeps on going all the way through the book of Judges. But what I love about that, even though Judges ends on a really dark and ugly note, and the, one of the final statements in the book, there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You look at that and you go, man, what a mess. There's, there's nobody trying to do good in the book of Judges. Till you get to the next book. That's right. Ruth takes place during the period of the Judges, and you see nothing but godliness there. And what that points out to me is no matter what situation there is, there is always a faithful remnant, and God knows who they are. Amen. Um, that is always true, and you are absolutely right. And you think about those great moments of the judgment of God upon the earth, Noah. God says, I'm going to destroy everything that breathes the breath of life, everything, animals and, and mankind. It is over, and yet there's one who finds grace in his sight, and it's Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. And so we have eight souls that are saved on that boat in, in the darkest time the world had ever seen, as far as we know, and as it pertains to the judgment of God. And so that they're an example to us. And Peter's not worried about sharing Noah over and over and over again. That this guy looked to Noah. This this has happened once before, and he's telling Christians this has already happened to the earth. Noah was faithful with his family, Lot, as we talked about, and, and his daughters. They they were found faithful in God's eyes in a very dark and difficult time. And and one other that was I think is such a great verse because it, it it opens the door for us in what the Lord is doing, how he works. And we're talking about the remnant and the faithful in God, even in the worst times. Uh, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 9, again, the Bible is so gracious to us. God's word is gracious to us to allow us to kind of put our ear to the door and really hear and see what's happening. So in Ezekiel 9, Ezekiel says that he saw this. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had a writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eye spare nor have any pity Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. That is scary. God's angels are standing before him, and he's, they are prepared to go out and do whatever he tells them to do, and he says, kill them all. But before, just before they're set loose, the man with the inkhorn on his waist is sent first. Mark out those who are mine. The, and, and what's the qualifier for those who are his in this moment is that they mourn over the, the wickedness. That's what Peter tells us about Lot, that his righteous soul was vexed. So if you're troubled in this world and you're wondering why no one seems to care anymore, you're in a pretty, 
pretty sweet club, I would say. Yeah, you're in select company. I, I love that picture in Ezekiel from from chapter 8 on through chapter 10 and 11, the whole picture that revolves around the temple and what God is doing there. He's The whole picture is God is leaving the temple. Yeah, He's, he's had enough. He's withdrawing his presence to get ready for judgment. But look how slowly he leaves. The picture is given to us that the, the glory left the most holy place and stopped at the threshold. Yeah. Just like... He's looking back, hoping, he will, maybe this uh, they'll listen. Then he goes into the courtyard and stops. Then he goes up onto the Mount of Olives and stops. And then he's gone. Mm. So God didn't just rush out, oh, oh, goody, now I get to zap them all. No. No, he left reluctantly. Uh, I believe he left sadly. Oh, but, man. But you're seeing that picture. You see why he's leaving, the way the elders and the priests and what have you are acting in the temple. It's it's grotesque. That's right. But the time has come. And as much as God doesn't want to, his character, his holiness, and his justice have to be satisfied. Yeah, that's right. And so there comes a point where God's patience runs to its limit, and he has to judge there's, there's just nothing else left, but God has done everything he can to spare the people that judgment, but it's up to them. Yeah. And fortunately, there are those few who do hear, who, as you say, they, they, they are troubled by the sinfulness and the wickedness they see around them. They're, they know they're in trouble. They, they know it's wrong, and it bothers them. God respects that. Yes. He honors that, and he spared those who had his seal on them. That's right. The, the ink horn, the man with the ink horn, whatever it was he put on him, you know, save this one or whatever. That was God recognizing who the faithful remnant was and sparing them from what was going to take place. Yeah, and the slaughter, as that slaughter begins, there are those, just picture them in your mind's eye, that there are those who are standing in the middle of all these people and there's a mark on their head. And it's, it's enough that these angels would see that, recognize it, and go right by them. They are, the, they are God's people. They cannot be touched by the word and by the will of God. I love that. And I think you know, the Ezekiel thing helps me too with sharing the gospel. Someone says, why, you, know, why do you, you just want me to do what's right in your eyes, or why do you want me to do what you want me to do? That's not it at all. I want you to follow and obey God and learn his way. And in, in the process of doing that, you're going to help me. Because we're both working through this together. But you can't stay where you where you are. And imagine someone telling one of the ones who mourn over the wickedness in the city. Imagine that conversation happening when when the judgment came. When those angels swept through and started slaughtering people. That the, someone was saying, please, please, you know, son, daughter, friend, whoever you are, please do what's right. It's so clear. And you're, you're out of bounds. You're outside of God's will. Please come back. And in that moment... If, if we think about sharing the gospel in light of what God's shown us, that they're coming. God's judgment is coming. And you have, you have time now. That's his graciousness and that's his compassion, which we've been talking about. Use it wisely. And that, that's our title from Second Chronicles 36, God's Compassionate Judgment. The God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because... He had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. It's a beautiful passage. Yep, and that's that's basically the motive for everything God does is love. Even in what we would look at as the bad stuff. Yep. Uh, Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11 tells us God chastises his children for their benefit. It's unpleasant, the Hebrew writer admits that, but it's for your ultimate good. God wants what's best, and if we refuse him, then he has to deal with sin. So there's from just this little short passage in in Deuteronomy or uh, Second Chronicles 36, we've we see a lot about God. <laughs> yeah, and that's always how his his word works, mm-hmm. and, and it's very interesting to go through that. Man, I, we have a lot to think about. We covered a lot today, from Abel to Zechariah, son of Berechiah. 
A to Z. A to Z. God has sent his messengers to warn his people and continues to do that today. So yes. it's, it's an encouraging message for sure. I have a couple of trivia questions for you. Uh-oh. Yeah, I I'll do. I'll see what I can do. Okay. Let me, um, let me go first. You can go first, Danny. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Question number one. Trivia. Sweet trivia. What was the sin that caused Uzziah to fall? Uzziah? Uzziah. Oh, Uzziah. Uzziah. Yeah, okay. He uh, he entered into the temple to offer sacrifice, and that was the priest's job. Yes. And they even withstood him and said, you don't have any place here to do this. Leave. And, of course, Uzziah being the king, and he's kind of arrogant right now, or he wouldn't even be in there doing this, mm-hmm. he resists the priest until he gets a little message from God. <laughs> Leprosy broke out on, on him. On his forehead, yeah. Yep. And so the priest instantly shuffled him out of the temple. Yeah, he ran out and they helped him along. Yeah. What was the condition of his heart? What's the sin? Well, I'm, I'm, I don't recall what the scripture specifically says, but he had lifted his heart up. That's what the scripture says. Okay. When his heart was lifted up, he went into the temple to burn that? incense. Yeah. You get lucky every now and then. It's pride. Yeah, but it's but a prideful attitude. You you did the right thing by or saying he wouldn't what the Bible be says. in there, like I said, doing what he's not supposed to do. All right, you're doing what's wrong, O King. <laughs> Get out of here. You're halfway well, to a gold star. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, goody. <laughs> we'll see how you do. Okay. First question: Who was Diotrephes? He was a man. Very good. Thank you. He is mentioned once. Yes. In Second John. Close. Third John. Yes. Okay. Don't count that against me. I got oh. it right second time. Okay. Okay. I'll and, cut and you John, some slack. John speaks of him as, as one who had taken over uh, the assembly of Christians who were there by not letting them receive some and... He basically was dictating who could come in, who could go out, and even was speaking evil of the apostles, from what I understand from that yeah. passage. And as you asked me of Uzziah, why was he doing that? What was his motive? What he must have been heart? a West Texas rancher because he's you know, full of pride. <laughs> well, I've never met a West Texas rancher. So I have. <laughs> okay, so you know what you're talking about. They like to run the show. And that's what John said. He loved to have the preeminence. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very good. yeah. By the way, not all West Texas ranchers. I, and that was way too far of a uh, that, broad brush. There's probably a faithful remnant among them. Yes, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's Third John nine that talks about uh, diatrophies. And and he's somebody we should be looking out for. You know, just yep. the warning is there. Don't let somebody come in and start ramrodding everything they want to do. There there is an eldership or should be. We have deacons. You know, there's an evangelist. God has the order that he's prescribed, and it must be followed, or mm-hmm. we're, we are not in the Lord's church if it's not being followed. So my second question for you, third question for everyone out there, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells us that we should not judge. Later in that chapter, how does he tell us when we can know who men are, whether they're good or evil? Because he says, don't judge lest you be judged. But later, how does he tell us we can know? By their works. Yes. And what, what does he call that? He does say works, but he mentions the trees. You got a bad tree and a good tree. Oh. <laughs> I helped you too Thank much. Thank you for those hints, uh, Danny. Uh, you can judge by the fruit that they're bearing. That's right, by yes. their fruits. And I love that because if someone says, hey, you can't judge me, I'm not. I, I sure am a, I'm a, a fruit investigator. That's what I am. Yep. And just as he says in John, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's right. So we are supposed to judge. Amen. But not by our own standard. By God's standard, yes, okay. sir. Okay. Well, I officially award you your gold star, Danny. Yes. Uh, well, no, you should award mine because I just answered it all right. Well, I'll take mine now. Okay. <laughs> because you'll probably get this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, you should, being a preacher. Uh-oh. Um, so here's our final question. What did Moses have to say about muzzling the ox? Oh, I don't know. 
Don't muzzle do the too. ox. Yes. Because he has a right to partake of the grain that he treads. It's Second Corinthians 9.14. It, yeah, that quotes the law in Deuteronomy. Don't yeah. muzzle the ox who treads out the grain. That's right. And Paul makes the point, is he concerned about the ox? No, he's concerned about those who work in the kingdom. Nice. So you don't deprive the ox of the benefit of his work in treading out the grain. Just as you should not deprive uh, a gospel preacher or any laborer in the in in the kingdom of God, uh, the benefits for the work they do. Yeah, and he says to the Gentiles, they they gave you. Speaking of the Jews who shared the truth with them, he says they gave you spiritual things. It's right for you to share with them yeah. carnal things, it's just things of the world. You know, a way to live, a compensation of some kind. And so that, I, that directive from Moses, by the way, is found in Deuteronomy twenty five four. Very good. Thank yeah. you for that verse. Uh, I really blew that. I don't want a, a star of any color. That that was terrible. I should have I should have done much better. Well, I was going to give you a bronze one at least. Uh, I don't want it. So, I think, oh, man. Okay, Danny. Just a red X or something is before. <laughs> there you go. So we well, talked. We don't want a blank spot on your on your achievement board. That's true. At least an attendance mark. We talked about God's compassionate judgment, and just I'll read again, just Second Chronicles thirty six, and think about all that we discussed today. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. 